Uh, let me make it a quick introduction. Uh, Patrick Frierson is the Paul Pigott and William M. Professor of Philosophy at Whitman College. Uh, sorry, William M. Allen. Let's get the title right. Uh, he teaches courses in the history of European philosophy from roughly 1600 to the present, as well as philosophy of education, environmental philosophy, philosophy of science, philosophy of religion, ethics, logic, and a wide range of independent studies. He is the author of several books on the 18th century philosopher Immanuel Kant, dozens of articles on philosophers, including Rene Descartes, Adam Smith, Immanuel Kant, and Maria Montessori. Now, best known for her um, educational system, she was also a sophisticated but largely ignored philosopher. So Patrick's most recent book on Montessori called Intellectual Agency and Virtue Epistemology, a Montessori Perspective, uh, we may hear from him and that book today. Uh, he's currently working on a book entitled Maria Montessori's Moral Philosophy. His work is funded through a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities. This summer, he's received excellent assistance, he says, with the book from a wonderful Whitman student through the faculty student summer research program. Welcome, Patrick, take it away. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, many, many thanks to Jennifer for putting this together and inviting me to participate and to you all for coming. Um, I guess I'm gonna skip most of my introduction of myself because that was a great introduction. I'll just add, um, I went to the Whitman of the East for my undergraduate, Williams College in Massachusetts, <laughs> and then the University of Notre Dame after that. Uh, and I have three kids, age 9, 11, and 15, who all went to Montessori schools at various points uh, in their past, but are now in the public schools in Walla Walla. Um, so I'll say a little bit more about me and how I got into Montessori later on in the talk, but I want to start with just some stuff about Montessori herself. And um, I put in the chat a link to a site that just has a biography of Montessori. I'm going to just touch on a few highlights, but if you want to come back and look for more, um, you can do that. So Montessori uh, was born into an upper middle class family in Italy in 1870 and died living in Holland in 1952. So that's kind of the time period that she spans. She began her life, as one of her biographers said, wanting to be anything but a teacher. So her parents tried to send her to teaching school because that's what was typical for women. And she insisted on going to a school to study math and engineering. And then she graduated from that high school and went to the University of Rome and got a degree in physics and mathematics. And then she went on from that to become, for a long time, people said the first, but one of the first women to graduate with a degree in medicine from the University of Rome. So she practiced as a doctor for several years uh, and she was put in charge of, a, I guess what we would now call a psychiatric institution, but it was an institution for children that had everything from learning disabilities to severe mental illness to just poverty. And they were all kind of thrown in this one institution um, because they were failing in various ways in school. And she helped direct this, this place. Um, and in that context, kind of gradually over time as she worked more and more with these kids, she came to think of the problems that they were having less as medical problems and more as pedagogical problems. And so she shifted from trying to prescribe medication to trying to come up with environ rich environments that would allow them to flourish um, and allow them to grow and develop as people. And so then many of the children in her institution started to outperform local kids on various like entrance tests for different high schools and stuff like that in Italy. And she, she became quite famous started to become an advocate for children, for conditions for children in Italy. And then all of a sudden in 1901, she dropped everything and went back to the University of Rome to study philosophy. So that's like my hook that she's really a philosopher. So she's known as an educator. She was also really known as the first doctor in Italy. She was a really important feminist, but she was also really importantly a philosopher. And she went and spent several years in a graduate program in philosophy with some of the top philosophers in Italy at the time. 
Um, and she says she went there in order to understand the basic principles of human nature on which pedagogy should be based. And so a lot of what I've been doing in my work is trying to take writings of hers that are oriented towards teachers or the general public advocating for the rights of children and try to show how she's doing sophisticated philosophical work in those writings. Um, so everyone always says, oh, you're talking about Montessori's philosophy of education, which I am, but really what I'm trying to do is talk about her philosophy more generally, how she's doing the work of a philosopher from this position of training teachers. So as, uh, as she was at the University of Rome, she gradually moved from studying to teaching. She taught in the teacher's college there and then was chosen to run a new experimental school in a group in, in a sort of develop a housing development for low wage working class people in Rome who were basically who were gone all day and their children were there and the, the developers said we need something we need someone to take care of these children during the day. So Montessori came in and set up a school and that school became her opportunity to try some of the things that she had done in her previous institution, but now with so-called normal children, as opposed to deficient children, which is the label that they used for the kids in her institution. Uh, and we'll, so we'll come back to some of what she says about that first experience shortly. Uh, a little bit back to me. So I got into Montessori for a lot of different reasons, some scholarly, some pedagogical, and some more personal. Um, at a scholarly level, my, my whole research career um, from beginning of graduate school 25 or so years ago, all the way up until now, I've been really interested in human freedom and the way that human freedom expresses itself and the way humans develop in their capacity as free beings. And so in, for my first book, I focused on the philosopher Immanuel Kant, as Jennifer helpfully pointed out, and this paradox that comes up in Kant's philosophy where on the one hand, he thinks we're free in such a way that nothing outside of our own will can affect what we do. And he's really firm on that as a condition of moral responsibility, that if we're going to hold people morally responsible, their decisions have to be totally up to them. But then he has all this stuff to say about what society can do to help people make better choices. So I was trying to figure out, like, how, it, how is it totally up to us that we're totally free, but also we can have this effect on each other to make better choices? I'm not going to tell you the answer to that puzzle. You have to come to another talk or read one of my other books. But that primed me to be interested in philosophers that are trying to think about the relationship between education and freedom. And for Montessori, that's really the thing that Montessori is interested in, is how do you develop an educational practice that both respects the freedom that kids have, so it treats, it gives children freedom, and also cultivates freedom in them, cultivates them into beings that are capable of living a free life. I like to think about this as sort of a nice definition for what a liberal arts education is. That a liberal arts education is an education that liberates. It makes its students free. And that's what Montessori is interested in. You could think of her as like the preschool liberal arts educator, where she wants to create a liberal arts education for kids from birth all the way up through adulthood. Um, so in a scholarly way, I was really interested in her. And obviously, you've already seen how that kind of bleeds into pedagogy, that I was interested in reading philosophers that are thinking about how to respect students' independence while also cultivating in them the skills they need to be independent adults. Um, personally, these concerns became particularly important about 15 years ago when my oldest child was born. Um, and I was trying to think now, not just as a scholar about this philosophical problem, or as a teacher about how do I teach my students, but now also as a parent, how do I help my own children become in, independent adults? Um, and so uh, maybe this, I think it was the semester after my oldest was born, I came back and taught, I, I developed a class called Education and Autonomy. And this class was gonna make this a theme. So the theme of the class was gonna be how do we educate in a way that makes people autonomous, where autonomy refers to sort of governing yourself as opposed to being governed by things outside of you. Um, and I knew in that class that I wanted to read Kant because I had done so much work on Kant. He talks a lot about this. I knew I wanted to read the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau 
because he has a whole book about raising a child to be an autonomous adult. And then I wanted someone else to stick into that class, and I didn't really know who. But a friend had given me a copy of this parenting book called Montessori from the Start that was basically about how you raise an infant in a Montessori way. And that book had like had a really big impact on me in thinking about how to raise my child. I would recommend it. Mon I should type this in the chat. Montessori from the start. Um, and there's kind of, it, I had something of the reaction to that that I had to Kant when I first read him, which are that there are these claims that just on first reading seem obviously ridiculous. And then with a little bit of thought seem obviously true. So the book seemed filled with stuff like that. So I thought, well, I wonder if Montessori herself has written anything that would be worth assigning to my students in this class. And so I went, I went out and found some books that had been translated or that had been initially published in English from Montessori and was just sort of blown away by how profound she was as a philosopher, given that no philosopher that I know of has ever paid attention to her as a serious, as someone worth taking seriously. So suddenly I discovered this philosopher that no one had ever paid attention to. And that led me first to continue teaching her, then to start teaching some independent studies. Then I used a sabbatical to kind of dig deeper into her writings and what she was up to. And then it sort of snowballed where I've had, you know, then more independent studies and teaching more courses and students doing research with me. Um, and now I've written all these articles and I'm in, in the middle of a couple of books. So I've written articles on lots of different dimensions of Montessori's philosophy. In this talk, I'm really gonna focus just on the material in my books. The book that I just published, which I will hold up and it has a nice pretty cover. Um, so this was published last year and it focuses on Montessori's epistemology, which actually I'll say a little bit about what epistemology means in a second. And then the other book, which does not have a snazzy cover, because right now it's just a bunch of pages. Um, it hasn't been published yet, but a student is working with me this summer and we're just finishing the last read through before it goes off to the publisher. So you're gonna get like some kind of previews of the next book coming out today. So I wanna talk about those two things and that book focuses on her moral philosophy. Uh, both of these are rooted in something that I've come to appreciate more and more about Montessori's overall philosophical method, which is that her general approach as a philosopher is to create environmental conditions where children can just freely exercise their lives, can freely live their lives, and then to observe what makes those children's lives fulfilling and use that as a way of developing standards for what constitutes a fulfilling human life. So instead of looking at what adults say they find fulfilling or what she kind of sitting in an armchair thinks would be fulfilling, she looks at what children actually find fulfilling when they're given freedom. And that's where she gets most of her philosophical ideas is from that careful observation of children. Okay, I want now to read um, a short passage from Montessori's description of an event that happened in that first school when she, when she was kind of given a classroom of her own uh, in, the, in the low income housing developments in Rome. And this event sort of gave kind of like a, a sort of light bulb went off and the rest of her philosophy kind of spins out of, the, of her experience of seeing this child behave in a certain way. And while I read this, I'm gonna show you a video, not of the same child because I couldn't take, I couldn't find a YouTube video of a kid from 1907 working with these blocks. But uh, let me go ahead and share the screen. But this will be a video of a kid doing something like the work that Montessori was observing when she observed this. And now it's weird because I can't see any of you. But um, I'll also just warn you, she uses the terms deficient and normal those were standard terms of the time. They wouldn't be my preferred way of talking about these children. So play this and read her quotation. I was making my first essays in applying the principles and part of the material I had used for many years previously in the education of deficient children to the normal children of the San Lorenzo quarter in Rome when I happened to notice a little girl 
of about three years old, deeply absorbed in a set of solid insets, removing the wooden cylinders from their respective holes and replacing them. The expression on the child's face was one of such concentrated attention that it seemed to me an extraordinary manifestation. Up to this time, none of the children had ever shown such fixity of interest in an object. And my belief in the characteristic instability of attention in young children who flit incessantly from one thing to another made me peculiarly alive to the phenomenon. I watched the child intently without disturbing her at first and began to count how many times she repeated the exercise. I counted 44 repetitions. When at last she ceased, it was quite independently of any surrounding stimuli which might have distracted her. And she looked round with a satisfied air, almost as if awakening from a refreshing nap. Okay, I'm gonna come back to you all. Um, so, so this is this event that Montessori witnessed. And the three-year-old child who I, I'm gonna call Sophia, Montessori never names her, but I just wanted to have a name for this child in the book so I didn't have to keep saying the three-year-old child with the cylinder box. So Sophia became for Montessori a paradigm of agency, intellectual virtue, and even ethical life. And sort of within her pedagogy, this event became the key to quote, the discovery of the treatment required by the soul of the child, end quote. So what Montessori did was to develop teaching materials and a classroom environment that would allow for and sustain the kind of concentrated attention that she found in Sophia. And gradually, she says, this sort of active engagement, quote, became common among the children in connection with certain external conditions, end quote. So this was kind of the way she developed her pedagogy was figuring out how do you get kids to just dial in in this way? and be self-motivatedly interested in stuff like this, this cylinder block work. Equally importantly, Sophia exemplifies many of the central features that Montessori came to identify as fundamental to excellent human lives. Her sensorial attention to the objects, her, her physical dexterity, moving things around, her patient engagement, and her clear love of the material exemplify dimensions of excellent intellectual engagement with the world. And her expression of agency, her self-governance, and the persistence that she had come to define the character that was the core value of Montessori's moral theory. So in the rest of this talk, I'm gonna highlight two of what I'm gonna call arenas of human excellence, corresponding to two different subfields in philosophy. The first is what philosophers call epistemology, and the second is what a philosophers call moral philosophy. Um, so I want to I want, I want to start, I cut myself off earlier when I was um, about to tell you what epistemology is because I didn't know what epistemology, I didn't know what the word epistemology meant until I got to graduate school. Uh, and so I always find myself in my classes with my students just saying, hey, anybody know what this word means? Just so, so I catch myself and realize that now that I'm a, you know, full-on professor, I use all this terminology that my students don't necessarily know. And when I was in college, my professors kind of forgot to tell me. So I discovered, discovered it in graduate school. Does anybody know what epistemology is? Melody, is that a hand? I can't see all of you. But. Sure, yeah, that's a hand. Um, so What's, the study of how we come to know things from episteme. Yeah, epistemology is, episteme is like knowledge. And then logi is like biology or psychology. So it's the, it's the logi of knowledge. It's the study of knowledge or how we come to know things. And for much of the 20th century and even much of the last five centuries, epistemologists focused on defining what knowledge was. And they had this sort of state stock definition that to know something is to have justified true belief of that thing. So if you have a belief that's true and justified, you know something. And then a lot of what epistemologists did is try to figure out what counts as being justified. And then, unfortunately for me and my philosophical trajectory, in the 1960s, a philosopher wrote this article where he came up with a couple of thought experiments that showed that justified true belief is not knowledge. So epistemologists for the past 50 years 
have been talking about what you have to add to justify true belief to get knowledge, and they've been refining the definition and then refining counterexamples and going back and forth. I found that really uninteresting and kind of nitpicky as a way of doing epistemology. Uh, and so I never really got into it until about the same time that I was getting interested in Montessori, epistemologists also started expanding the way they did epistemology. And in particular, there was a group of epistemologists that called themselves virtue epistemologists. And virtue epistemologists are not interested in defining what the word knowledge means. What they're interested in is thinking about what are the virtues that are relevant to knowledge or to thinking or to cognitive engagement. So traditionally, the ancient Greek notion of a virtue is just some kind of an excellence. Today, we normally think of virtues more as like moral virtues, but for the ancient Greeks, you could have a virtuous knife if it was really sharp and easy to hold, or a virtuous horse if it was well behaved and you know went really fast. Um, and you could think about sort of the virtue of a butcher or the virtue of a cyclist, where you know it's a virtuous person, but you're focusing on them in a particular respect. And so what virtue epistemologists did was to say, let's think about what are the virtues of humans as thinkers. One of the things humans do, not the only thing, is think about the world. What are the virtues of thinkers? And then they came up with things like uh, open-mindedness. So open-mindedness would be an intellectual virtue or intellectual humility might be an, inte an intellectual virtue. Uh, so I'm gonna now read just a, a little snippet from the book kind of saying a little about how this movement in epistemology opened space for me to think about Montessori's, Montessori in connection with what contemporary philosophers were doing. Here we go. The growth of virtue epistemology in general makes today an excellent time to introduce a new voice into contemporary epistemology, which is what I want to do. Linda Zagzebski, who's a contemporary philosopher, has recently suggested, quote, we should admit that questions of most significance to epistemology in the a-skeptical periods have been rejected or have been neglected. And it is time that we cease the obsession with justification and recover the investigation of topics that have been important for epistemologists in other historical periods." End quote. So what Zagzebski, who's, this, who's a contemporary epistemologist is saying is, all of this obsession with what counts as justification arises in a really narrow slice of what epistemology is really about. Let's look at what all of the people who have explored the nature of knowledge have, have done. What are some of the other questions that people have asked? And among those other questions are questions about what you should cultivate in children and what makes for an excellent thinker, what the goals of education should be. So this book, offers an investigation of Montessori's epistemology with specific focus on her account of the virtues that constitute the excellent use of epistemic agency um, or intellectual agency. So one of the things that I emphasize in this book is that for Montessori, thinking and coming to have knowledge is not a passive process. Every part of coming to know the world is an act. It involves us doing something, not just passively taking things in. Uh, someone asked for the book's title. So it's Intellectual Agency and Virtue Epistemology is the title. Someone can type that up in chat. Uh, okay, so what are the virtues on which Montessori focuses? So in, in the book, I emphasize seven main intellectual virtues. I'm not going to talk about all of them today, don't worry, but I'm going to try to give at least a, a taste of a few of them. So the seven that I talk about are intellectual love, sensory acuity, physical dexterity, patience, intellectual quickness, humility, and courage. So these are things that Montessori wants to cultivate in thinkers, in, in, her, in the children. And in each case, in the context of the book, I talk about what the virtue is, why we should think it's a virtue, how it can be cultivated. And then also, just because of the, the target audience for the book, I kind of wade into some contemporary debates about various of these different virtues. So, you know, people argue about the nature of intellectual love and I show how Montessori fits into those arguments. So I'm gonna to try to talk about three of these 
uh, but I want to leave at least some time to talk about her moral philosophy too. So this part of the talk is about what makes a good thinker. The next part of the talk is going to be more about what makes a good person as a whole. So the first thing that makes for a good thinker is what Montessori calls intellectual love. And I'm like, I want to give a shout out to Lauren, who Lauren Wilson, who's here today, who helped me with this book quite a bit, and also uh, took my my little bits of discussion of intellectual love and did a great job connecting that to thinking about intellectual love in the sciences and how they play out in the sciences. So a little bit of what I'm going to say owes to today, owes to Lauren's work. So one core principle of Montessori's overall epistemology. Oh, one other thing I want to say um, as I go into these intellectual virtues, I'm going to share my screen again briefly, is I want you to be thinking as I talk about these virtues about how what this child is doing both illustrates the virtues and how it might cultivate those virtues. Okay, so that's kind of something to keep in the back of your mind. This, I don't know this child's name either, so I'm gonna call her Sophia too. Every girl that I don't know her name ends up being Sophia. Maybe it's because I'm a philosopher. Uh, okay. A core principle of Montessori's overall epistemology is that intellectual engagement with the world, thinking about the world, is always mediated by the interests that one takes in one's environment. So she doesn't have, she doesn't see even our senses as purely passive. All of our attention is always selective. And so when we notice something in our environment, it's because in some way we care about it. Uh, let me see. And so here I'm gonna read a decently long section of this, starting with a quotation from Montessori where she talks about the role that genuine love plays in children's ability to observe the world. And then I'm gonna go on and talk about how that applies to, to sciences too. So Montessori says, quote, it is indeed a form of love that gives children the faculty of observing in such an intense and meticulous manner, the things in their environment that we grown cold pass by unseen. Is it not a characteristic of love that sensibility that allows a child to see what others do not see, that collects details that others do not perceive and appreciates special qualities which are as it were hidden and which only love can discover. It is because the child's intelligence assimilates by loving and not just indifferently that he can see the invisible." End quote. So that's from Montessori. And then I go on, it's funny to refer to myself in that. anyway. Just as one who loves another person attends to details of that person's demeanor and mood, so for these children, love of their environment leads to attentive intellectual engagement, which allows them to see what is invisible to others. And this point is not limited to children. A similar intellectual love is at play in all intellectual agents, of whom Montessori most often discusses scientists and artistic geniuses. Those are her main adult examples of excellent thinkers. She points out as a general distinction between what she calls old students and the modern experimental scientist, that while the former merely absorb the knowledge of others, the latter are passionately interested in their work. And this love does not come from studying alone, but comes only when one brings himself into contact with some natural truth or reality through which secrets are revealed." End quote. And elsewhere, when Montessori again is contrasting mere dilettantes with genuine scientists who have a true capacity for observation, she explains the differences between loves in terms of what she calls passionate interest. So she says, quote, the soul of the scientist is entirely possessed by a passionate interest in what he sees. He who has been trained to see begins to feel interest and such interest is the motive power which creates the spirit of the scientist, end quote. Uh, and then I go on to talk about several examples of this. So Einstein, for example, when he talks about his own capacity to do physics, he says, there is no logical path to these elementary laws, only intuition supported by being lovingly in touch with experience. And I love that idea of like being lovingly in touch with experience is what gives Einstein the insight that he needs. Uh, and then Jane Goodall, um, who is often used as an example of an excellent thinker in, in a lot of this literature, 
talks about her first love not being for knowledge, but rather a love of animals, first in general, and eventually focused on the particular chimpanzees that she made her life's work. Um, and she says, uh, in a way that really echoes a lot of stuff Montessori says. So Jane Goodall says, quote, in order to collect good data, I was told, it is necessary to be coldly objective. Fortunately, I did not know that during the early months at Gamba. A great deal of my understanding of these beings was built up just because I felt such empathy with them, end quote. So Einstein and Goodall and Montessori are all pushing towards this idea that the, the the most excellent kind of engagement with the world, ep epistemic or intellectual engagement with the world, is something that involves us at a, at a passionate level where we care about the thing that we're studying. And I'm not gonna show this next YouTube video that I pulled up, but I wanna just send you a link to a great little thing that I think it was actually produced by someone at Whitman in our communications office. Um, but it's a, it's a little, uh, explanation by Kate Jackson, who's a biology professor at Whitman. Just, and she's just sort of talking about her research on snakes. And if you watch her talk about her research on snakes, it's clear that she is not coldly indifferent to snakes. She loves them and like passionately loves them. And one of the things that I think is actually great about Montessori and about Whitman, and I would say this is characteristic of liberal arts education in general, is that in every discipline, but including the sciences, the way that we engage intellectually with the world is not just through a series of facts or like collect collections of knowledge or even techniques, that part of what Whitman professors are really good at is transmitting this passionate interest or this love in the things that they care about. Um, and that's an intellectual virtue that Montessori really emphasizes in her own work. Okay, I want the sec so that's the first one. So the first intellectual virtue is intellectual love. The second intellectual virtue that I want to talk about is sensory acuity. And I want to just um, read a little bit about kind of ba basically what I mean by this. So, uh, and actually, yeah, actually, while I'm reading this, well, no, I'll, I'll wait to do this till the next time. <clears throat> so, sensory acuity is really a cluster of different virtues involving acuity or sort of sharpness or excellence in each of many different sensory capacities, such as visually distinguishing shapes, visually distinguishing colors, distinguishing tones by pitch, and so on. As with all the virtues, intellectually virtuous sensory acuity consists of the sorts of sensory ability that facilitate humans' capacity to intellectually engage with reality excellently. So the idea here is that in order to really think about the world and have a good have a good understanding of the world, we need to be able to sense it. We need to, in, in some way, it, it needs to get access to us through our senses. And so one of the ways that humans can be excellent is through being sensorially, sensorially excellent. Um, we can see really well or hear really well. Now, in contemporary virtue epistemology, when, when virtue epistemologists today talk about intellectual virtues, the senses are a kind of big bone of contention among philosophers. And they're a bone of contention because on the one hand, it seems very clear that having excellent, say, hearing or excellent sight makes you better in your capacity to understand what's going on in the world. You can see more and hear more. Uh, but on the other hand, it seems weird to call it a virtue since it seems like we're not really responsible for our sight or our hearing. Like you're just born with eyes or ears. And so you just have it or you don't. So some people will say um, it doesn't count as a virtue because you can't take credit for it. And other philosophers will say, even though you can't take credit for it, it still does count as a virtue because it's conducive to understanding the world better. So Montessori agrees with both and disagrees with both which I think is really beautiful. Uh, and in particular, what she disagrees with is something that all of these uh, virtue epistemologists have in common. And that is that we can't take credit for our senses. That whether you can see something or hear something or smell something, it's just a matter of what capacities you were born with. And this is something that is pervasive among discussions of the senses. But before I start reading it, since I'm gonna now be reading for a little bit from the book, 
I want to give you something else to look at because you've looked at me long enough. And this next thing is super beautiful. Um, you're not really going to understand what's going on until I've explained a little more about sensory education. But I'm going to go ahead and start this now. So one of the things that many contemporary virtue epistemologists agree on is that we can't take credit for the senses. So here's one philosopher who thinks that we shouldn't call them virtues, says, we are born with the ability to see. Intellectual virtues, by contrast, are cultivated traits. They are settled states of character that come about by way of repeated choice or action. So these don't get to count as virtues because we didn't give ourselves the ability to see. Then a couple of philosophers who think they do count as virtues, nonetheless say, sensory perception is an intellectual competence that comes with our brain, or in normal circumstances, one might form justified perceptual beliefs simply by having good eyesight and so forth that, are fun that is functioning correctly. Um, and then one philosopher who kind of tries to split the difference says, vision is a natural virtue. After all, even children possess the virtue of vision. So the idea is, you know, maybe it's a virtue, maybe it's not, but it's not a virtue like the way a lot of other virtues are because it's just something you're born with. Even children have it. So Montessori disagrees. Uh, not only does she see sensory perception as interested activity, something that you have to do, it is activity that can be trained and cultivated. The senses are not, fi are not a fixed way of accessing the world. Children engage in what Montessori calls sensory gymnastics or sensory exercises in order to cultivate them. And you're seeing an example of a teacher showing what a sensory exercise would look like. Through such, ex through such exercises, sensory reactions become ever more and more rapid and errors more quickly detected, judged, and corrected. And sensory stimulus, which might before have passed unobserved or might have roused a languid interest, is vividly perceived. In other words, so that's what Montessori says. In other words, we learn to see or hear or feel by learning to select certain perceptual details that's relevant and to distinct, dis, distinguish among salient details more and more finely. So perceptual awareness itself is an intellectual virtue and it's something that's acquired and developed through exercises of one's selective agency. I'm gonna talk about those yellow ones in a little bit. One way to see the role of sensory exercises in cultivating acuity is to look at variability in sensory acuity, which goes far beyond differences in biological endowments. Consider perfect pitch, for example, the ability to label or identify an isolated tone in the absence of a reference tone. Some people have this ability and other people do not. But the distribution is not random and does not seem to be biological. Chinese and Vietnamese language speakers, whose tonal language depends upon accurate discrimination of pitch, have perfect pitch at a dramatically higher rate than speakers of non-tonal languages, like English. Differences in perfect pitch seem to be linked to early cultivation more than to innate differences. And I would add, especially they seem to be linked to the relevance of perfect pitch in early childhood, right? Because that's what leads to, to this cultivation. Consider two scientific observations. And here, this is a quotation from Montessori. When an attempt is made to show untrained persons stellar phenomena by means of the telescope or the details of a cell under the microscope, however much the demonstrator may try to explain by word of mouth what ought to be seen, the layman often cannot see it. When persons who are convinced of the great discovery made by de Vries go to his laboratory to observe the mutations in the various minute plants, he often explains in vain the infinitesimal yet essential differences, denoting indeed a new species among seedlings that have hardly germinated. It is well known that when a new discovery is to be explained to the public, it is necessary to set forth the coarser details. The uninitiated cannot take in those minute details which constituted the real essence of the discovery, and this because they are unable to observe. That's the end of Montessori's quote. So much that one learns in becoming a scientist consists of sensory capacities, such as the ability to discriminate features under a microscope or to identify distinct shapes in a telescope. One dramatic example of variability in sensory acuity is illustrated by a Montessori material called the color tablets. And that's what you're looking at in this video. 
Teachers begin by exposing children to distinctions based on extreme differences in color, like the difference between the lightest blue and the darkest blue, or between red and yellow and blue. Over time, they provide materials with more and more refined distinctions so that students gradually train their senses to perceive more precisely. As students develop interest in fine-grained distinctions amongst colors, they cultivate more fine-grained visual acuity. Um, and I think I'm going to actually skip another long quotation, but Montessori talks about how this happens with visual dis dis distinctions and then also all kinds of other senses. So you do this with like tone bars where you're listening for different tones or smelling jars where you're trying to distinguish different smells. Two children at different levels of sensory education with color tablets see different things when looking at a moderately light yellow tablet. One learning differences among primary colors will see yellow, but be unaware of the particular shade. Uh, one working on shades has a more precise sensory perception because he's interested in the increased details. And one who has worked on these materials can finally distinguish shades of the relevant colors based on past efforts. Just jump back to here. So just a little bit. Uh, these differences are not present merely in children. And here, the, the yellow tablets for me were particularly profound. I'm not sure whether this comes out in the YouTube video or whether you trust yourself in the YouTube video. But when I first looked at the yellow series, I actually couldn't distinguish between two of the, uh, between like the third and the fourth yellow tablet. Uh, what Montessori highlights in this work is that sensory perception depends upon attention and that it's cultivatable. So for Montessori, sense perception is something that counts as a virtue and it counts as a virtue because we actually do work in order to develop it. I'm gonna stop sharing now, even though those things are, I, are so beautiful. Uh, it seems like we adults just have senses as a matter of biology, but in fact, we learn to see and to hear and to smell. And most of us who grew up speaking English and didn't play violin when we were little, didn't learn perfect pitch. Um, and, and my guess is that none of us have learned dead reckoning, even though in the research for this chapter, I found that there are some people who from a very early age, it becomes relevant to know which direction is north. And you can take them and spin them around and drive them 50 miles and bring them into the woods and say, where's north? And they'll point to north. They seem to have a sense for direction that we just never cultivated because it never mattered to us to cultivate that. Okay, oh, I think I forgot to do this with the intellectual love, but now I am gonna go back and look at our um, cylinder block work. So let's talk, whoops. So let's talk about Sophia and we can talk about both of the first two virtues. How does, how does Sophia illustrate intellectual love or sensory acuity? Or how does this cultivate either intellectual love or sensory acuity? Anybody, and I can barely see you, so you'll have to just, if somebody wants to give an answer, you have to just unmute and jump in. Do you see any love or do you see the cultivation of love? Any sensory acuity or cultivation of sensory acuity? Her uh, facial expression certainly shows that she's engaged and committed. And, you know, she's little furrowed brows shows that she gets frustrated when it doesn't fit and kind of smiles a little bit when it does. Yeah, she is clearly not being forced to do this. She wants to do this work. Um, and actually it would be really fun to get some of Kate Jackson's or like any scientists most engaged moments and put them next to her and I, my guess is that you'll see some of the same facial expressions that she loves what she's doing just like a really astute scientist loves what they're doing um, I would highlight just one other thing related to the cultivation of love that's really important I hate these ads at the end uh, which is that and I, I can stop the share um, which is that for Montessori, one of the things that's so important about her classroom is that Montessori thinks that intellectual love is natural. We naturally love our environment. 
But in many classroom and even home environments, that love is constantly squashed because as soon as someone gets really interested, as soon as a child gets really interested in something, they're forced to go on to something else or they're forced to do something that they're not really interested in. Um, and for Montessori, that leads children to repress that natural love that they would that they would have. Um, does your book, sir, sir, does your book include data of interviews with parents or families who've used Montessori education for their children and have found the rewards that you're describing? Because as you go through your explanation and as you shared this clip of the intensity and engagement of the young learner, I was certainly reminded of the three of our children and how uh, being able to move independently through a Montessori educational program that allowed them to explore their love of learning of a particular aspect of the Montessori education curriculum um, was, it was just, it was such a contrast to all the visitations we've made to other uh, preschools where children had spats and were vying with each other. And in there in the Montessori classroom with the mixed age level, the older ones were helping the younger ones. And there was a pursuit of, uh, for want of a better term, their personal best or excellence and whatever they were particularly engaged in. So that's a great question. My book doesn't do those interviews. Um, one of the things, so I'm like getting connected in more with the Montessori researcher community. And I'm the, I'm the philosopher and the intellectual historian. And there are some sociologists and a, and a decent number of psychologists and neuroscientists. So there's one psychologist in particular, um, Angeline Lillard at the University of Virginia, who's done a lot of empirical work with like longitudinal studies of tracing students in different kinds of schools, um, controlled like controlled longitudinal studies. She did one, I think in Wisconsin, where she took students that all applied to the same Montessori school, but some got in and some didn't and traced how they developed um, differently based on where they ended up. And she's also collected a lot of other psych psychology research that's not specifically on Montessori, but is relevant to the claims that Montessori has made. I don't think there's been really good sociological work based on interviewing parents that, that at least has been widely published on how, Mo how Montessori works from the standpoint of parents' reflections on their children. Uh, but that's something that like I fully support someone doing. It's not what I'm likely to do. <laughs> that's just not like, I'm, a, I'm the philosopher, so I read texts and figure it out. So what I'm good at and what these people like kind of appreciate me for doing is saying more clearly what the claims are that they need to go out and test. And then they can take those and go out and test them. Right. So your question is spot on in terms of what needs to be done in the future. Okay. Okay, I'm actually, I'm gonna talk about one more intellectual virtue. And then I think I'm just going to mention something about her moral philosophy. I'm not gonna um, go into any detail on that but you can ask me more questions about that if you, if you wanna hear more detail on that afterwards. Um, but there's one other intellectual virtue that I wanna talk about, because this is one, every other intellectual virtue in the book, at least some epistemologist you know, in the past 50 years has talked about it as a possible candidate for an intellectual virtue, but nobody talked about physical dexterity as an intellectual virtue until I brought it up in the context of Montessori, even though there's a lot of other philosophical work in other branches of philosophy that should have led people to think about this. Um, so I wanna talk just briefly about that, about Montessori's claim that the ability to move your body in an intelligent way is an intellectual virtue. So this virtue got the most initial resistance from professional philosophers for reasons I've, I've just alluded to. Uh, and I will say one of the things that I like about Whitman, again, about Whitman as an institution in terms of thinking about Montessori as a liberal arts teacher and Whitman as a liberal arts institution is that Whitman does actually take seriously intelligent movement as a part of what it is to provide an overall liberal arts education. So this comes out most explicitly in the context of music and dance and theater where like learning how to move your body intelligently is part of the academic curriculum. 
And it's also a really important part of sports and like the new climbing wall that we built. Uh, I'll say actually when I first, when I taught this class for the first time, I had been so struck by Montessori's account of intelligent movement and like the nature of intelligence of the body um, that I really wanted that to be a theme in the class. And Whitman had just built this awesome new climbing wall. So I got a, a really small grant to pay climbing instructors to teach me and my students how to climb on the climbing wall so that we could experience what it's like to learn a new, like a really new physical skill that makes our body move in different ways. And we could also reflect on what intelligent movement means and what the intelligence of the body means. And that it was, that was a very fun experience for both me and the students. It was also kind of a great way of, like my students definitely learned faster than I did. So they got to see me floundering around while they felt like they were floundering around reading these really hard philosophical texts. So that was great. Um, it was actually only after reading and teaching Montessori for a while when I went back and started you know, doing research on her for my on my sabbatical that I realized that actually this notion of integrating intelligence and the body is one of the hippest new movements in what's called philosophy of mind, which is philosophers who think about kind of the relationship between mind and body and the nature of the human mind. And in particular, it's, there's this research program that's been called embodied cognition, which is basically the idea that our thinking doesn't happen by some disembodied soul. And it doesn't even happen merely by a brain, that thinking takes place in the entire body. Um, and embodied cognition theorists have done a lot of, like have lots of examples that they use to try to think about this. There's only one that really does a lot of work with very young children and showing how this plays out with very young children. And Montessori does a great job with that. Um, so in my book, I talk about ways that the brain and body are integrated in young children and then also in places where you might not think they would be, like philosophy or theoretical physics or mathematics. Um, and I wonder, I wanna see, uh, I think, I'm trying to see if I actually want to read this just a little bit. Um, no, I think I'm not, I'm not gonna do that because we're running, running low on time and I wanna give plenty of time for, for Q and A. But I'll just say one of the things that, that Montessori really focused on and actually, I'll at least show you another video, is thinking about how training or teaching children to move their bodies in certain ways can actually teach them to do things that we traditionally think of as intellectual or academic skills. So here, there's a bunch of children that are using kind of do-it-yourself, made-at-home versions of these things which are materials that you find in every Montessori classroom. These are consonants. And sometimes they have them in cursive, sometimes in print. The consonants are in pink, the vowels are in blue. And what this is, is just a, a hard background that's smooth with a letter written in sandpaper on the background. And by the time they get to these materials, children have done a lot of work with sandpaper to basically refine their sense of touch to learn the difference between smooth and rough and then different degrees of roughness. And so they're interested in using their sense of touch. And what they do with these letters is just trace the letter and try to stay on the line. So it's this kind of fun activity that they're doing where they're trying to stay on the sandpaper line and they can easily tell when they fall off because suddenly it gets smooth. And while they do that, they say the sound of the letter. So a child would go, er, er, because this is a cursive R. So they're tracing it with their finger. So Montessori had these materials in that initial school in San Lorenzo in Rome. And after kids had used these for a few months, suddenly this one four and a half year old boy got a piece of chalk and started writing words on the floor. He had never been taught to write before, but he knew how to speak. Luckily, he spoke Italian, a phonetic language. So he knew how to speak, and his body knew how to write letters. He didn't know he knew how to write letters until he picked up chalk and started actually writing them. But his body had been trained. And so what it allowed him to do is 
shift so that the only intellectual labor he was involved in was connecting his bodily movement with the words that he wanted to say. Whereas often when we think about teaching children to read or write, or I think about this in the context of typing, we're teaching so many different things at the same time. And many of the things that we're teaching are, are new ways of moving the body that people aren't accustomed to. And so Montessori focused on how these intellectual tasks like writing or even reading, actually one of the things that kids sort of learn to do is turn pages because that's a manual skill that we often underestimate that to turn a page takes work and you have to get your body to be able to hold it with, in just the right way. Um, so kids learn the bodily components of these intellectual activities and then they can just focus on whatever the other little connecting things are that integrate the ways that their bodies move. And I, ever since reading this, oh, sorry, I don't want you to look at all the weird stuff on there. Um, it, ever since doing this, I've been much more attentive to the way that, for example, my own research and writing depends on my ability to type at a certain speed, that if I typed more slowly, I'd actually be thinking more slowly. And I had never kind of paid attention to that before. Um, I'll also just, oh, so actually I wanna come back to this activity again, one more time, of how do you see physical dexterity playing out in the cylinder blocks? How is she expressing and cultivating intelligent movement? Yeah, Jody, great, pincer grip. And Actually, one of the things about the Montessori classroom, especially for kids of this age, and here's another example. This is a puzzle in a Montessori class. Um, and you can see hey, Pat, a puzzle. Pat, you're not sharing your screen with us. Oh, darn it. Now I'm gonna share. There you go. There we go. So on this puzzle, I was looking at the screen I thought I was sharing. back. So on this, this frog puzzle, you can see each piece has a little button on the top. And so when kids work with the puzzle, they lift the pieces by those little buttons. And then when they put them back in, they're moving the pieces around to get them to fit. Again, exercising that grip, the very grip that they need to hold a pencil. And the, the pincer things are designed to be the size of the typical pencils in the classroom. So if you combine this, kids have a very strong and clear capacity to grip a pencil and their arms, oh, we can ignore that. That's getting to more advanced stuff. And their arms naturally move in ways that make letters. Once you can hold a pencil and your arm moves in a way that makes letters, you're writing. All you need to do is know how to talk at that point, to know how to write. And then from writing, you build up to reading and various other intellectual skills. Um, okay, I'm just gonna, now, basically skip what I wanted to say about moral philosophy, except to just say this. So what, we've talk, what I've talked about so far are the, are the virtues that are characteristic of an excellent thinker, someone who thinks about the world well. Life isn't all just thinking, and life in a Montessori classroom is not focused only on the intellectual virtues. It's also focused on what it takes to be a good person as a whole. Um, and so Montessori creates environments not only to cultivate intellectual virtues, but also to cultivate moral virtues. And as a philosopher, she figures out what moral virtues are by looking at how children in conditions of freedom behave. And so one of the things that she found to again, go back to Sophia with her cylinder blocks is that there is a, a way of engaging in activity that is self-motivated and persistent and that's trying to do things right and get better and better that is incredibly fulfilling. So that quotation that I had at the end where it was like she woke up refreshed from as though she had awake, awake refresh from a refreshing nap. Um, that was something when Montessori observed that it was so clear that that was a component of a good life. And then when she looked around at her adult life, she found the same thing, that people who were constantly just kind of doing humdrum work that they didn't care about in order to earn the paycheck to pay for the food to go back to the office and do the humdrum work they don't care about were living lives that were recognizably less rich than people that were dialed in and really engaged with what they were doing. And so that became one of the fundamental 
kind of virtues of her moral theory, what she calls character, which is this kind of dialing into things you really care about. Um, she also found that when you put children in a community where they're with other children, and especially if you replicate the real world where there's scarcity, that children naturally respect one another. Um, but the respect often takes forms that are different than what we think children are supposed to do. So one of my examples that I often bring up about the difference between Montessori respect and like, I don't know, current common sense respect has to do with sharing. Where for both Montessori and many contemporary parents, it's really important for kids to learn to share. <clears throat> the way I typically have seen that play out in like in my own unreflective moments or less Montessori moments and in my friend's moments with their kids is that when a child is, is engaged in the way that Sophia is engaged and another child walks over, the adult intervenes and makes the engaged child give the material to the other child. So that's kind of one conception of sharing. Montessori has a very different conception of sharing because for her, that dialed in engagement is so important. So for Montessori, what it means to share is if you see a child dialed in that way, leave them alone and wait for them to finish. And so in Montessori classrooms, there's a lot of children waiting for each other as opposed to interrupting and then giving stuff to each other. Um, help, help is an, another important piece of this, but, but non-interruption is a really important part of respect. For it. Um, and then a third thing that I'm just gonna brief, like just say the word is that Montessori uh, sees social cohesion, which is a kind of group action where we're not just respecting each other, but we're actually working together on something as a really important part of what moral life consists in. So there's obviously a lot more to say about Montessori's philosophy in general, about the things I've talked about today, but I wanna at least have some time for open discussion for you to ask whatever you're most interested in asking about. So I will leave it at that. Thank you, Pat. If you have a question, you can wave, you can unmute, and just throw it out there. Ellen. Hi. So um, this is a question that in some ways, obviously, I already have some thoughts about. Um, and I'm just going to give the quick like reason why I have thoughts about it, which is that when I went back to um, subbing in the midst of the pandemic year, I went back to elementary school because they went back to school first and I didn't like subbing online. Um, and one of the things I quickly realized in a second grade classroom that I was in for several weeks was like, oh my gosh, I'm dealing with second graders who haven't held a pencil in about a year. And so one of the things I'm really thinking about um, as we prepare to go back to school in the fall, and I'll probably go back to the special education classroom that I've worked in, um, is what do we have to learn from Maria Montessori about what we need to do um, in the fall as we recapture kind of fully embodied education, hopefully, um, among students who've missed, um, very significantly missed embodied education for some really important um, milestones in their lives? Yeah, so that is, that's a great question. And actually I should have known that that question was coming and I should have prepared more for it. Um, I'm not teaching in a Montessori school, but I do, but this is something that Montessori teachers are like, have done a lot of thinking about, about how to make these transitions back. So there's going to be better stuff out there than what I'm about to say. Uh, and part of what I, I would say is actually a little bit tragic. So one of the things that Montessori, kind of a, a concept that really Montessori first introduced into developmental psychology and pedagogy is the notion of critical periods or sensitive periods of development, where there, and, and really those are periods of interest. So there, there is a time in a child's life when something like putting all the shades of color in order is gonna be incredibly exciting and fun. It is not gonna be incredibly exciting and fun for my 15 year old. He's just not at that stage of life. So for him, it's gonna be brutal to develop that kind of refinement. I mean, not brutal, but it's, it's not gonna be fun for him to develop that kind of refinement and he's probably not gonna do it. So 
kind of at a certain point, if you haven't developed something, it's really hard to develop it after that. Uh, and so Montessori talks about this, for example, with writing and reading, that in her ideal model, kids learn to write at least a year before they learn to read because they'll learn to write somewhere three and a half to four and a half, and then they'll learn to read after that. And that's because writing involves all these manual skills that kids of that age are really interested in. And then once they can write, learning to read is pretty easy. That becomes really difficult if kids skip that. And so she says, if you've got a five-year-old, teach them to read first, and then just expect the teaching of them how to write to not, to not be super fun because they missed the time when it was gonna be fun. Um, and I do think, you know, it, this is a less big deal after age six. It's a really big deal before age six. So kids that missed in-person kindergarten and in-person preschool, there, I, I think there's gonna be pretty serious, you know, problems, not unfixable, but, it, but they're gonna be hard. So that's the pessimistic piece. Um, the more like helpful thing concept from Montessori that, that, that I would apply in this case is one of the things that Montessori tries to do throughout her pedagogy is something she calls indirect preparation. So the, the frog puzzle is a really good example of indirect preparation for writing and the, and the cylinder blocks are a really good example of indirect preparation for writing, even the sandpaper letters, where you have kids doing something that doesn't look like it's teaching them what it's actually teaching them. So playing with puzzles is teaching pincer grip. It's teaching them how to hold a pencil properly, but they just think they're having fun doing a puzzle. And I guess one of the, I, I'm so, so I'm not sure, I, I don't have the kind of on the ground experience to see how this would work in, in a particular context, but my ideal for, especially in a special ed classroom or like where you have, a, you have a little more opportunity to attend to student specific needs than you often do in a bigger classroom is to try to find the things that kids want to do and think creatively about how to use what they want to do to make their bodies like take on the shape that they eventually need to, to take on. Um, so even instead of like working on a lot of person or a lot of like writing, start by just working on coloring or, or free drawing pictures and just like get them, get them holding the pencil a lot and then gradually move to, to the other or sewing would be, I mean, sewing is a little different in terms of the way you hold it. So if you really wanna focus on the writing, you probably wanna have them doing something else, but sewing does get a different kind of fine motor skill. I've thought, although I failed in this with my children, that like, given how important typing is in the world today, it seems like piano should be taught a lot more than it actually is, because it's developing that keyboard, like the motor memory that you need for tapping keys. My son actually types with six fingers because he spends so much time playing video games, which <laughs> don't even get me started on video games, but that he's just used to a mouse in one hand and a keyboard with the other hand. So these, these three fingers have like, he doesn't understand why they're not always in this shape. Like why you would ever move them. And again, like he's training his body in a certain way that piano would at least force him to exercise this. So, so indirect preparation would be at least one little Montessori trick that you could use. Thank you. That was a great answer. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, hi, I'm a, so I'm a high school physics teacher and a new mom who's just kind of getting interested in the Montessori thing in general. And a lot of the stuff that I've been learning about Montessori is often written in the context of preschool and those young kids, but it really resonates with what I've seen in my own classroom. And I'm curious if there's been any thought about does Montessori pedagogy get applied in, in secondary level? Um, and what does that look like? So, um, yes. And here, so Mon Montessori started with like two and a half to six. And then over the course of her life, expanded outwards from there. 
So she wrote quite a bit about like birth to six. And then later in her life, she wrote a lot about six to 12. And then she has a few essays about kids after 12. She has one that I always teach when I teach her on the function of a university. Actually, I'm teaching it to first year students this coming semester on the function of a university where she talks about like what, what a Montessori university would look like. Um, so I, I can, I mean, that, that there's a book that she has, um, I'm trying to remember, I, I think it's from childhood to adolescence that has some of those older kid stuff in it. If you want to see like, what did, you know, Montessori herself have to say. It, starting about 10 or 12 years ago, I think, the Association of Montessori International made adolescent education one of its priorities. So if you Google like AMI Montessori adolescent education or something like that, or high school, you'll, you'll, you'll find stuff. Um, research, basically research has started about a decade and a half ago. And there are definitely some Montessori high schools out there so probably the most famous one is a farm school in Ohio, where it's a, it's a residential school where kids go and just op and operate a farm and everything that they learn is in the context of that. Um, I know I met someone who run, is a, I think a math teacher in a Montessori high school in Northern California that I think is a public Montessori high school. Uh, so it's there, but it's young. So this is kind of like, I would say for you, if you get really into Montessori and you're a high school physics teacher, you're in a great place to actually shape what Montessori science curriculum looks like for high school because the movement is still young in terms of thinking about how that plays out. Oh, cool. super interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Melody was next and then Jody. There we go. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I just want to say that yes to the previous questioner, there's vibrant secondary education. I'm actually just, I finished a elementary Montessori training program and I'll be teaching this year and it's really exciting and a lot of fun. Um, but my question is actually more philosophical. I'm con uh, concerned about, excited about the idea that we can develop a virtue in the sensory areas as you were talking about. That's um, a really interesting novel way to think about virtues and previous life Aristotelian um, philosopher. So my question, I guess, is how does that complicate your thinking about, well, how does the, the idea of sensitive periods, which is so important to her idea of um, that sort of excellence, like you're talking about with the color tablets, if the window passes and you haven't learned to discriminate between your yellows, the chances that you're going to be able to have that sort of virtue, that sort of excellence uh, is vastly diminished. So um, I'm curious to hear what thinking you've done about how that metaphorically maps onto the development of moral virtues, uh, this idea of sensitive periods being somewhat limiting uh, to what we're capable of achieving. That seems really problematic and nerve wracking to me. Uh... So you said you were an Aristotelian in a former life too? I'm not a former life. I'm, tr I'm combining or, some life, but yeah. <laughs> so, so I think this is a problem for Aristotle too. Yeah. Not just for Montessori. Uh, and I think it's actually mostly a problem for adults. But, but, like it's, so it's, I, I think it's not a philosophical problem. It's an actual problem for adults, which is <laughs> that we... So Mo Montessori actually talks about how children and adults have two different, two different tasks in the world. The task of the child is to create the adult. And the task of the adult is to create the world. So adults shape the world and children shape adults. Uh, and since I'm the child who created me, in that sense, I'm, respon like, I'm responsible for who I ended up being because it was by virtue of my work that I came to have the habits and the characteristics that I have. Um, responsibility can be shared because I also grew up in an environment of a certain kind that affected what was available to me. But I think Montessori is pessimistic and kind of rightly pessimistic about the capacity of adults to make fundamental change. It's, it's going to be brutal 
And that's true, not just for sensory development. So if I never develop perfect pitch, developing perfect pitch now as a, you know, almost 50 year old is gonna be really hard. Maybe impossible, maybe not, but at least it's gonna be really hard. Learning to play violin, I've tried, my kids play, play violin and I have tried to learn to play violin and it is really painful to try to get my body into that position to play the, to play the violin. It's painful for them, but a lot less than it is for me to try to so, And I think morally, if I, and I've seen this in, in myself and in, and in friends and colleagues, if, I, if I'm not capable of finding something that I'm genuinely interested in and pursuing it, like if I don't have character the way Montessori describes character, it's gonna be, it's gonna be hard for me to get that out. Of, if I'm totally extrinsically motivated, becoming intrinsically motivated, it's hard for adults to do. And so Montessori sometimes in her moral theory talks about how there's the ideal of the character driven person who pursues perfection, like from thoroughly, thoroughly integrated intrinsic motivation. And then there's a kind of second tier thing, which is someone who doesn't have that, but is able to at least get themselves to act well and not mistreat other people. And she says, I, I wish I, you know, I kind of, I wonder if I, no, I'm not gonna be able to quickly find this in my manuscript. I could find it in the book with books in another room. But she says something like, you know, that they'll do it. They'll govern themselves by good, like they can govern themselves by good rules, but it will be a hard life because it's not coming kind of fundamentally from within. Um, so again, that's the sort of pessimistic piece that, and, and for Montessori, this is also why, this is something that I talk about with my students in, I think it's the beginning of her first, her first book, which came to be called The Montessori Method in English. She talks about how crazy it is that society sees college professors as like the pinnacle of education when basically college professors make no difference. I mean, not maybe not totally true for Whitman, but even at Whitman, we admit really good students and they leave really good graduates. And I hope that I made a difference in between, but they started good and they ended good. Um, and we tend to devalue preschool teachers who actually do make a difference. And preschool teachers actually do shape who people fun fun fundamentally become. So I think for Montessori, shifting attention towards those early years is part of why she really and kind of accurately says, once you hit a certain age, it's extremely difficult. You've passed the time when all these character formation things happen. Uh, there is some research, like there was a when I was doing work on um, sensitive periods in connection with sensory acuity, there is this group at the University of Chicago that actually has taken adults and gotten and like taught them to speak wildly different foreign languages without an accent. So like native Chinese speakers speaking perfect American English with no accent. And they've started doing work on get cultivating uh, pitch discrimination in adults. So I think it's possible to do, at least based on their technique, it seems like a lot of what ends up having to happen is that adults have to do exercises that are incredibly boring for adults and incredibly engaging for three-year-olds. And, and I think that, like, to me, that's both depressing and hopeful. And the hope piece of it is that, you know, you, you, probably can do this. You can get yourself to develop in ways that a four-year-old would develop or a three-year-old or a two-year-old. Because the nature of sensitive period is largely driven by the nature of our interest during those periods. So it's partly brain plasticity, but it's also partly that it's only when you're a certain age that you're interested in that thing. So if you can force yourself to do what you would do if you were interested, you can develop. That's, that last piece is not Montessori. Like she doesn't say that. Right. But fake it until you make it. Yeah, except it's even different. It's more like do the exercises that will cultivate this capacity in you, even though, yeah, they're just not at all interested. Your real life is going to be different at six. Mm -hmm. Your material is 18. 
right? So wait, sorry, who's talking? Well, it's, it's time for Jody's question. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just well, I had a couple things. I the previous to, I guess, the question of physics teacher. So I'm a Montessori elementary teacher up here in Canada, and I work at a school that graduates. Um, so it's K to 12. And I oh. have three, three daughters who have all been Montessori educated. Um, one is graduating next year. Um, so I highly, highly, highly recommend the physics teacher to explore because um, it's been incredible in my my eldest who's graduating, she uh, has always been pretty passionate about dogs and she has been um, raising puppies for a guide dog service. And just, I think her um, education of allowing her to follow her passions has created this um, incredible, generous and passionate person. And she's very dedicated. So it's very anecdotal. It's just my family, but I've seen lots of students graduate from our school that have been Montessori um, educated throughout and it's pretty incredible. So just wanted to, to cheer you on to follow that. But I also wanted to um, ask you, Dr. Friesen, is about, um, I'm an elementary teacher and she goes into a lot about um, cosmic education and um, the co that everything in our world has a cosmic task and wondered how that ties in with philosophy and if you've um, researched that and engaged with that. Uh, I have, so I'm trying to think, what's the short way to put this? Um, so there's a, a few things that, that happen in the context of elementary. One of them relates, or uh, one set of them relates to cosmic tasks. In my work, Montessori's, the stuff that she says on cosmic tasks and like um, cosmic education is the main place, that's the main place that I look to find her overall metaphysical view of the universe, like her conception of what the fundamental nature of reality is, because she lays that out most clearly in, in that context in thinking about what education should be like for elementary students. In terms of what I was talking about today, I didn't get into any of the ways that these basic virtues change when you go from pre-elementary to elementary years. And one really big one is that all of the sensorial work that happened pre-elementary or you know, prior to age seven um, gets incorporated into this expansive imagination in the elementary years where you're suddenly taking these abilities to make fine-grained discriminations and then expanding them to think about the world as a whole. Um, another thing, and I only barely talked about her moral philosophy, but the, the striving for excellence that Sophia manifests in her own effort to do the cylinder blocks well, that there's sort of, there's different layers of striving for excellence. So she is trying to just do that one task really well. As children mature, they try to perfect their capacities more generally. So instead of just trying to do cylinder blocks well, she's trying to expand her concentration or something like that. In elementary years, children become aware of the way in which their own perfections contribute to perfections of a greater whole. And so one of the things that Montessori really wants to get kids to do, not so much as five-year-olds, but definitely as nine-year-olds, is to see their place in a bigger picture so that their own efforts towards like doing things better and better are, they see those as contributing to this bigger world. Uh, and there, there's other things too, but those would be at least a few things I would highlight. Actually, I wanted to really quickly ask, well, first to thank Melody and Jody for being Montessori elementary teachers, um, but also just to ask, do you have a sense of like what the best place to look would be for material on Montessori High School, other than just Googling Montessori High School? So, so I'm elementary uh, trained, but there are training programs in the States, um, in Houston and in Cleveland. Okay. Um, so Betsy Coe, I think, might be one of the educators for the secondary Montessori, okay. um, or definitely would be able to guide you to that. And I'm afraid I can't really add much to that conversation. I, I only know that there, from what I've heard, 
the programs that are out there are really flourishing and in high demand and people um, we, we've been told here, we're contemplating opening an adolescent program, and we've been told here that prepare ourselves for people wanting to move to our community just to attend the school from out of state and elsewhere, um, because there's a certain sector of people that realize that this is a, a pretty neat thing. Jody, what was the name of the school that your kids went to? Uh, they go to Maria Montessori Academy. It's in um, Victoria, British Columbia. Thanks. Yep. We've got time for one more question, if that's all right. And the, yep. Lindsay has had her hand up for a little while. <laughs> sure, thanks. And, and thanks for a really, really interesting lecture. Um, my question is also about elementary. So tell me if it's sort of beyond the scope of your research. But I was interested, since you do have such a focused on, a, on epistemology, if you have done any uh, research or writing about the, the cognitive role of the great lessons this idea that they provide this cognitive framework for um, elementary students. And if you've done any, any research into that, I'm actually an elementary um, Montessori teacher trainer out of Southern California. So I'm interested wait, wait, in your thoughts on it. Which school are you at? Um, the company I work for is called Higher Ground Education. Okay. And we run um, guidepost Montessori schools and our training center is called um, the Prepared Montessorian. Okay. So. Um. So I've thought about it. It's actually a gap in what I've written. Uh, basically, because working through the whole way that the imagination and abstraction work is, I just didn't have time to do that. So I, I talk about it and I like drop little seeds here and there, but I haven't worked through in detail how the, how, how in the elementary years, the, great lessons give order and structure to our imagination. But that's basic. But I mean, in, in a broad stroke, that's what I would say they do. So ordered thinking is a really big deal for Montessori. And the reason that all of the materials in early childhood are so carefully designed is because in early childhood, our cognitive order is formed by what we absorb sensor sensorially. And then in adolescence, imagination becomes more important than sensation as we're imagining other places and sort of thinking big, big numbers and big thoughts, big places. And so somewhere, I think this is in childhood to adolescence, she talks about like giving hangers or something to put particular facts on. And again, I think it's, it's, it's trying to set up a framework so that children aren't kind of in, like imagining dinosaurs without a context for where they fit so that every use of every cognitive ability fits into a, a coherent reality facing structure. And so those lessons are creating a coherent reality facing structure that kids can think in. Uh, yeah, that's, oh, I mean, the other thing, sorry, it, and this relates to intellectual love, is that elementary students aren't going to fall in love with a really beautiful like piece of wood that has amazingly fine sandpaper on it. They're going to fall in love with something big. And if you want them to keep being engaged in education, you have to give them something big. And so I, so I would actually really focus, like the role of the great lessons in fostering intellectual love is huge because it's speaking to those elementary students exactly where they are. Thank you so much. And again, thank you for training all these teachers. <laughs> all right, we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you so yeah. much, Patrick. That was thank fascinating. Um, uh, there are lots of comments in the, in the chat about how much people have enjoyed this. Thanks. So thank you for that. We will post this recording uh, along with our other virtual event archives on a YouTube page. And I will share that link with everyone who registered as soon as it's ready. Um, have a great night, everybody. And thanks for joining us. Thanks.